Now I want to start out with Midas Touch, and this is the first uh, recreated beverage that we did. And uh, this is the tumulus of the king at uh, the site of Gordian in central Turkey. I'm not sure how many people here have, have been out to see this or have been to Turkey, but this is the most prominent feature at the site of Gordian, which was the capital city of the Phrygians. And this is around 700 to 740 BC. It was excavated by the University of Pennsylvania Museum, where I come from, uh, in 1957. And what they discovered here is that this is a totally artificial hill. It's a, it was originally probably 150 feet tall, uh, but they were able to cut a, uh, a trench back into this mound, and uh, there was a, they discovered a log chamber, a double wall log chamber, right at the center, which was essentially a hermetically sealed chamber, because the logs covered the, the, the floor, the ceiling, all sides, and there wasn't any water that really got into this tomb. And uh, they had to then cut through the logs, and what they saw was a, a male, 60 to 65 years old, laid out on a very thick bed of uh, textiles and felt. And the textiles were dyed red and blue, which are the royal colors of kings in, in the Near East. And we did do an analysis of the blue. That was an indigo dye. Uh, the red, we've never, it would be very interesting if we could sometime uh, determine what the red dye is. I did a lot of research on royal purple, which uh, you might, you know, it's a possibility here too, but we've never uh, demonstrated that. Now, uh, according to the dendrochronology, radiocarbon dates, and so forth, uh, this dates, as I say, between 700 and 740 BC. And that would fit with the, the information we have about a real King Midas in the Assyrian text. But it also fits with his father named Gordius, and the site is named Gordian. And so there's some sort of a, a controversy about, you know, exactly who is buried here. We don't have a sign that says, you know, here lies Midas or here lies Gordius. So um, we do know it, it, it is the most uh, prominent feature at the site. It has these extraordinary vessels, as you'll see, that are in the tomb. So it is a royal burial. And in the background here, you will see what is considered the largest Iron Age drinking set ever found. This is uh, some 157 bronze vessels, okay? Um, and, you know, you might ask yourself, well, if we're talking about King Midas with the golden touch, you know, where's the gold, right? Well, uh, if you take these uh, bronze vessels and you clean off the copper oxidation products, the, uh, the rust, as you see on, the, on these really spectacular uh, situle or buckets that were used to dip out the beverage from the cauldrons, um, if you clean that off, you will get something that looks a little bit like gold. And so we could have had a situation in which, um, you know, some wandering Greek, you know, comes through, you know, sees these really spectacular bronze vessels that is a brass, in fact, because it has an elevated zinc content. <laughs> And have gone back, you know, to his people during the Dark Ages and announced, oh, there's this uh, king, uh, Midas, uh, living in uh, Turkey that, uh, uh, you know, obviously has the touch of gold. And, uh, you know, then it just got perpetuated through the ages. But we don't know, for, you know, for sure how the, uh, the legend of the Midas touch did arise. Now, I wasn't uh, so much interested in... Uh, the forms of these vessels, however spectacular they are, but I was more interested in the contents of the vessels. And we were very fortunate to have actual residues of the original drink and the entree that was evidently served at the funerary feast. So they had a funerary feast before burying the king outside the tomb when they were finished, uh, you know, they, they obviously, the people that participated in the funerary feast uh, ate and drank and enjoyed themselves and sent Midas or Gordius off into uh, eternity. But then they also thought, well, maybe we better leave a little bit uh, extra drink and uh, food, you know, some leftovers uh, for the king. 
And uh, so this is a blow up, a, a magnification of the residues inside the drinking vessels. And there are very specific vessels that uh, form a whole sort of drinking set, a cauldron, jugs, uh, drinking cups, uh, and so forth. And you'll notice how golden uh, the color of this residue is. And um, I'll just mention what the entree that went with this drink is right now. It was a, according to our chemical evidence, it was a barbecued lamb or goat and lentil stew with spices added. And we don't know exactly what the spices were. They could be native Anatolian spices like wild fenugreek, um, bitter vetch. And also we have some indications that they probably had uh, used wine and honey in the preparation perhaps of the meat. Uh, but it was a stew. There was no bones in with the residues of the food. Um, okay, so that, that, that's the entree. Well, you, then you washed it down with this beverage that's represented by this residue. And it, um, uh, this is where we get involved in a whole series of, of chemical analyses to try to figure out what that residue actually represents. Now, this was the easiest excavation that I was ever on because uh, these residues had been collected back in 1957 uh, by the Penn excavators, and they'd had the foresight to bring back all the residues to the Penn Museum. You know, these obviously, these residues were of no interest to the Turkish authorities at the time. I mean, all the other artifacts, you know, the really beautiful ram-headed and lion-headed situlae and so forth, those are all in the Ankara Museum in Turkey. So if you want to see the, the, the artifacts themselves, you have to go there. But they didn't really have any concern or it wasn't this whole field of biomolecular archaeology at the time. So they said, okay, you could take all these residues back to Philadelphia. And those residues were still sitting in the original paper bags from 1957, two flights of stairs above my laboratory. So this is why I say it's the easiest excavation <laughs> I've ever done. I just had to walk up two flights of stairs, you know, collect the paper bags, and, and we transferred them over to other containers. But those. Uh, and we got right away doing our analyses. And uh, what, you know, I'm not going to go into a lot of the chemical analysis for those of you who are a little bit chemically challenged. But just to say, uh, you know, we used a whole battery of different tests, including infrared spectrometry, liquid gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. And we try to figure out what the, the key fingerprint compounds for different natural products are. And, you know, you can go through the literature and you can try to really delimit, you know, what uh, marker compounds to look for. So in the case of uh, grape wine in the Middle East, uh, tartaric acid uh, is uh, found in large amounts uh, only in grapes. I mean, it does occur in some other uh, plants in the region, um, but uh, it has... Uh, is predominantly found in large amounts than just in grapes. So if you can identify tartaric acid, you have a grape product. Now, you know, what grape product do you have? You know, do you, if you have a drinking vessel, it, it starts out as a liquid. So in the liquid form, uh, grape juice is like the ideal medium to start a fermentation, especially in a warm climate, because you have yeast on the outside of some of the grapes. And that uh, medium is, is perfect. And you'd probably you know, get fermentation in the first day or two uh, occurring. And uh, so we, we could definitely say we had some grape wine in, this, uh, in the residues inside these vessels. Uh, in addition, uh, there's very specific compounds for beeswax uh, that you can uh, analyze for and detect which we did have, and uh, you, if you have a honey product and you try to filter it or clean it up a little bit, you never can get rid of all the beeswax. So beeswax is a good indicator for a liquid inside of a drinking vessel that you're probably dealing with a honey uh, that, again, if that honey has been diluted down to one part of the glucose, fructose, and 10 parts water, there are yeast living in the honey that will start to ferment it and make mead. So this uh, was a, another ingredient. And then finally, we had something called beer stone. If you're a home brewer uh, or you know, working in a, in a brewery, uh, often you see this scum on the inside of the brewing uh, vats, uh, yellowish, whitish scum. 
and this is calcium oxalate, which is a very bitter compound, which uh, the beer makers refer to as beer stone. And you have to clean that out of the beer vat in between uh, fermentations because it, it, it isn't just bitter. I mean, it can actually be poisonous if you get too much of calcium oxalate in your system. So here we've got grape wine, honeymead, and uh, uh, barley beer because the, the calcium oxalate beer stone is formed when you do the fermentation of barley specifically. Uh, and now that sounds pretty ridiculous as a drink. At least I thought so 10 years ago and uh, when we did this analysis. And, uh, you know, it seemed, you know, who mixes wine and beer together and then put in mead? I mean, this just doesn't sort of add up. And, uh, you know, other people, <laughs> other people sort of felt the same way. And this is one of the illustrations of the new scientist. Uh, you know, this poor guy over here. He's obviously had uh, a little bit too much of this combination. This is an, this is an extreme beverage, you know. Do you, I mean, do you want to drink an extreme beverage? You know, maybe it's dangerous, right? It, uh, uh, so this, uh, <laughs> you know, this got me thinking that maybe we should do some ex experiments. <clears throat> uh, this is how we get, this is an Australian cartoonist who did this, by the way. And uh, I don't know where he got the image of my looking like that, but <laughs> I guess off the internet somehow. But, uh, you know, it got me thinking we really should do some experiments, uh, experimental archaeology to see if, if a, you could make a drinkable beverage out of these three ingredients. And we had a practical reason, too. We wanted to do a reenactment of the funerary feast, in which we did in the year 2000. And uh, as it turned out, I mean, it was a spectacular feast because uh, the chef at the Penn Museum had a real fine sense of how to do the stew. And then, as I'll explain now, um, we, we got a Midas Touch beverage to go with it. And it, the two just paired together so well. And so every year at the Penn Museum, we used to have a, an event where Michael Jackson would come. Now, this is not the, this is not the entertainer. This is the beer and scotch maven who uh, he would come every year and you know, do a tasting. And, and the night before, we would have a dinner. And so at the dinner, we had all these microbrewers uh, represented. And uh, I mean, this also gets into the issue, if you're going to do experimental, experimental archaeology on an extreme beverage, you know, who's more likely to go to the extreme, a beer maker or a winemaker? Well, my experience is the winemakers are a little more reluctant to try some of these things. The beer makers you know, are so far out that uh, <laughs> they'll, do, they'll do anything. And uh, so I got up to the, um, the crowd and I just explained the, you know, this beverage and how it had been found. And uh, if anybody was really interested in trying to recreate it, I would explain uh, in detail in my laboratory the next morning at 9 o'clock. Now, I didn't expect to see too many people show up at 9 o'clock, but there were 25 brewers that came. You know, and probably after a hard night of uh, drinking, too, I would suspect. And uh, they all went back, they went back to their uh, breweries and homes, and uh, they started uh, doing these different renditions uh, based on the parameters that we had. And they would then sh ship um, a bottle or two to my home. And, <laughs> you know, my job was to, uh, to, to figure out if any of these tasted any good and then decide if we were on the right track. And this is a tough job, but somebody has to do it. And, and as it turned out, um, you know, some of the, uh, the ones that didn't win the competition uh, uh, had one, did later win other competitions, uh, tasting uh, events as well. So we had a, really, a pretty good selection of uh, different beverages that were submitted. Uh, but Dogfish Head uh, is the one that uh, ultimately triumphed. And I was already sort of predisposed, I suppose, to Dogfish Head because uh, I first had one of their beers uh, on a, just on a whim going down into Delaware and stopped at a, a, a place called Buckley Tavern. And they had uh, the Shelter Pale Ale on draft. And I tried it, and I was really amazed. And then at that dinner uh, with Michael Jackson, uh, the dessert uh, beer was actually very similar to what the Midas Touch ultimately turned out to be. It was a mixture of wine and plums. So that instead of grapes, it had plums, and then it had beer. 
So it was, a, again, this a mixture of these three beverages. And, and as we now, you know, started uh, doing more research on this, it turns out during the Middle Ages, uh, they, they did produce a, something called 